Well, good evening to you, dear brothers and sisters. In church twice on a Sunday, are you? Those kind of people. Extremists. Religious extreme. Well, relational re extremists. That's what you are. He is forgiven much, loves much, right? I mean, how could we not respond to the kind of goodness that God has shown to us and be extreme? I'm all into that, man. It's, I wear that with a badge of honor. They, they, but, you know, the crazy thing is the world right now makes no distinction between the extremist who follow that false god Allah, do crazy violent things, and the extremists who follow Jesus Christ and do kind things and always have down through all of the centuries, known for good works. That's when you know the world's gone kind of nuts, really. They've really, they become so irrational. They can't see the difference between somebody who actually believes the teaching about love your enemies, turn the other cheek, and personal offense. And you can't see the difference between that and someone who is committed to taking the world by violence. Now, well, you're familiar with what is written in Galatians 6-9. Now, I, I realize, guys, you, normally... We be in Calvary Chapel, our whole thing is, you know, we're going to go through the Bible, you know, Bible exposition. But you got a guest tonight. You know, I'm just here for just a few minutes. We're together. There's no real big chunk of Bible we can go through in this amount of time. So tonight we go topical, right? Tonight we're going to focus on a topic, and there's a topic. And I would connect it to, first of all, what is written in Galatians 6, 9, about where it says, in be ye, weary not, that is, in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap, if you faint not. Weary not. Be you, you know, about the Lord's work, but do not faint. Don't weary in doing what's right. Because everything's seasonal. Everything is seasonal. And even Ecclesiastes, um, Solomon's conclusion that, his observation, as it should say, that there's time for everything. You know, Ecclesiastes 3.1. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. To everything there is a season, and there is a time to every purpose under heaven, for everything, even the things that seem so absolutely in opposition to each other. There's a, there's a time for it. There's a time to sow, there is a time to reap. The reality, though, about the world that we live in now and our you know, modern American culture is that we want everything immediate. We want it all now. Even when it comes to, you know, our prayers, we expect God to, I don't know, be like a microwave. Just make it happen. We have no patience. We, I submit to you that we have less patience than any generation that ever came before us because we get everything instant. We're the kind of uh, generation that, that um, comfort is usually just a button push away. If it's really hot, we push a button and it cools. If it's really cool, we push a button, it warms. We can have comfort almost instantly. We, in this modern age, can communicate in just seconds across the world. We are appalled when we have to wait. <laughs> oh. You listen to people on, airline, on, on, on airplanes. You know, they, they expect the airlines to be sovereign, like God, you know, and able to do anything. And as soon as the announcement comes of any delay, <laughs> Goodness, you hear the old plane just all sigh. Uh, all the passengers, the drama. <laughs> we are the great grandchildren of people that had to take weeks to cross this continent in great hardship and danger. Now we complain about a little discomfort, a little delay. It took me hours. <laughs> Imagine saying that. If you could go back in time to some of those who came west. The deal is still that way. It's still people, it, it still use the term out west, preposition out goes with west, and back goes with east. Because that is how we settled this country. Coming from Europe, we swept across and the adventurers that came west. You are their great-grandchildren. Those people were crazy. They went through unbelievable hardship. They fought. All the elements, they fought enemies, they fought hunger, the, the 
you know, prairie schooner creeping across the continent. <laughs> Imagine being able to go back to them and go, oh, it took like hours. <laughs> it's like one delay after another inside of a air conditioned building, having to wait. We don't believe in waiting. We're pathetic. That's what we are. We're pitiful. Absolutely pitiful. We want it all now. We, we, we want, if we have a pain, we want a pill. Make that pain go away. That pain's bothering me. Ever considering the possibility that maybe the pain's your friend? Now, I realize there's, you know, chronic pain. People hear, you know, you hear every now and then some stupid songwriter will write a song that says, well, you know, I'd rather hurt than feel nothing at all. Only an artist would say that. That's stupid. No, actually, the whole generation around us would rather feel nothing at all than hurt. That's the fact. You know, if you've got chronic pain, I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying. People that don't have your chronic and severe pain have a little pain like, oh, 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 oh make it go away. And they want a pill. Run away. Right away, they run to the anesthesia. They want something to make that stop quickly. Never considering that, you know, you damaged something, something is injured, the pain, the pain is your friend, the pain's an alarm, saying, hey, there's a problem, say, you know, leave that alone, let that heal, do something, right? We want something for the, give me something for the pain. We want everything instant. We're kind of pitiful that way. Well, there's nothing wrong with wanting your pain to end. And I was actually something real smart about that, you know, there's, Nothing wrong with wanting um, hardship to come to an end, but there's something really wrong with our inability to endure. Don't you think? There's something way wrong when we cannot endure. We're just such wimps. We've become so incredibly wimpy. It frightens me how wimpy our people have become. We want instant results on everything. It, the subject, the topic, actually, Summarized really with one word, pleasure. Pleasure. Is there anything wrong with pleasure? No, of course not. No, in fact, God is the one who invented pleasure. He designed us, he designed our, our, our whole being, he designed our brain even, to be able to respond, to process experiences, and release the very chemicals that go with the experience that cause us to feel pleasure, cause us to feel Euphoria, happy. It was his design that certain elements of his creation, we would find pleasure in that. We would go, oh, this is, we'd find pleasure in beauty. We'd find pleasure in even things like food, that we could eat a meal. And especially if you could eat a meal with people you love. In human relationships, we could feast. God invents the concept of feast. That we can actually come together and, and have an experience like a feast where the meal is good, the conversation is good, people we love, we laugh, you know, things are funny. And, I don't know, there's, it, it's God who, in, who made us with that capacity. The problem with us, really, is we want all that pleasure. We want it now. We want heaven. That's what we want. We are part of a generation that will do anything to experience heaven now, here and now. And if not real heaven, well, then the illusion, just the euphoria. The vast majority of our people, our culture here in America now at this time, are all on drugs. You know that, right? Everybody, in every direction, everywhere you look, despite all of our best efforts, despite trying to provide Consequences is deterrent despite all of the programs and the campaigns and despite all the education. Don't you love that? The presumption from the, you know, left. Those who are wrong. The fools who disagree with God. The presumption is that we're all good and so... You know, if we're doing wrong things and destructive things, it has to be just because we don't know certain things. <laughs> so they say, you know, edu education, that's the answer. Education. We have the best 
educated generation of hardcore drug addicts the world's ever known. <laughs> I've been working, I, you know, I'm a, ki I'm a son of a drunk, a drunkard, a man who died at 34 years old, a very accomplished drunk. He let uh, alcohol destroy his entire life. 34 years old, that's pretty young. That's as far as he lived, as long as he made it. So overcome by what that vice did to our family. God used it in my life to create a repulsion, an absolute loathing for alcohol. I've always hated it. A loathing that kept me from ever starting to drink. A fear of God and a fear of ever taking that potion to become that. I saw the effects of that substance turn my father, the husband of my mother, into a rabid dog. And you always tell the difference between, you know, beer drunk, a little sloppy, a little wobbly, but not too mean. With hard liquor, you tell you love the car, hard liquor, there's an evil, there's a different evil. And there's a violence, a meanness, an inability to empathize or to sympathize. Horrible. Turned him into a rabid dog. I can testify. And some of you have had similar experiences, right? I can testify. Being a little kid and seeing him in the dim light of that, that dark house, killing my mother, strangling my mother, choking her to death. There she is, naked, kicking, being suffocated in, the, in, a, in a plastic shower curtain in the middle of some violent, abusive sexual expression. And I'm seeing this, and I, and I scream at him, stop! And he breaks the spell for just long enough for her to drop and crawl away, live through the experience. And it's like he, and he became rabid, and he's looking at me like a rabid animal, like a, like a, like a dog that's completely insane. My, own, my father looking at me. Trying to, on one hand, it's like he's trying to process. Why is the kid yelling at me? A kid he can't yell at me. Wait a minute, what was I doing? You know? The, my loathing for alcohol because of such experiences kept me from ever drinking. I never drank. Guilty of plenty of sins. Not that one. Never drank. Never did any of those substances because I know the capacity. I've seen it. I'm that guy's son. I can become that. The, part of a generation that is all drunk or high on something because everybody wants to experience euphoria. Everybody wants to know bliss. They want it now, not later, not in heaven, and not based on any experience, bypassing all experience, we are now surrounded by the reality of the, you know, the weird sci-fi concept of a zombie apocalypse. They all talk about that. They don't even know what the word apocalypse means. Idiots. The, the apocalypse. Greek word means the revealing, the unveiling. But now it's come to mean something else in the world of science fiction. The zombie apocalypse is already happening. They're staggering around your neighborhood, but they don't look like zombies. They don't have rotten flesh, but they are rabid. Some of us have been them. Some of us have been under the spell, rabid, rabid enough to steal from family, rabid enough to not care about anything, to not only do they need that pleasure, the, the whole process of bypassing all experience and artificially stimulating the pleasure center of the brain for the release of you know, dopamine and everything else. This artificial mess in where the pleasure center of the brain creates a person that can experience no pleasure without that artificial stimulation, totally dependent upon that. Some of you, re you remember, you've been there. Whether it's alcohol or drugs, it's, it can come to the place where you can know no good experience without that artificial stimulation. A few weeks ago, you know, I, I've been working with drug addicts for as long as I've been in the ministry, decades, right? Started out really young. Started out young and, and getting trained to work with drug addicts when I was 16. And entered, entered ministry full-time as a teenager with a big voice. So if I didn't tell everybody, I was 16, they didn't know. <clears throat> you know, the guys that hired me knew. But the guys I was working with didn't know. They'd find out later and whatever, you know. Um, <laughs> recently, you know, one of the guys that kept, he, you know, he went through Teen Challenge. 
<clears throat> and he failed, fell back into heroin. This kid from my neighborhood, same age as my daughter. I love this guy. My neighbor, right? And then, you know, he comes through our program. He gets through the program and fails again, falls right back into heroin. And uh, ultimately, put him in special ed. He's in special ed. Now he's living in my house and he's staying with me all day long for a season of his life. You know, he's like, he's like strapped to me. Where my arms swing, there his swing. And um, where my feet step, that's where his go. And, uh, you, you know, I think he's like 40 days clean. 40 days he's back, you know, he's off of heroin and everything else. And, and, and I love this guy. Really, he's, you'd never know it looking at him. He's, he's tall and handsome, athletic. He's got all this charm and all this charisma and natural ability. He can, like, do all kinds of stuff. He's, and, um, you know, 27-year-old. But there was a night, a few, few nights back, believe it or not, it's still cold enough in the evening in Maine. He had a light of fire in the wood stove. And um, it was that way. And I lit a fire in my study, which is connected to the bedroom. So my wife would be warm. She'd go to bed. I still got work to go. I'm sitting out there. By the way, I, I'm recording the Bible, doing you know audio, because people ask me to, because I got a weird voice. And some people said, hey, would you just like read the Bible for us and record it? So, so anyway, I'm... Uh, uh, Hey, thanks a lot. I, if, if you, I don't know what you're applauding, but, it, but it, if that would be a blessing to you, I got the New Testament done. Now, I mean, I'm sorry, I got the Gospels, four Gospels. That's all, I'm working through it. But I'm way behind schedule. I'm staying up late. So there was, I'm trying to do this in the dining room, the dining room table. Everybody's asleep, and I fall asleep. <laughs> Head on the table. I'm trying to keep going, trying to be tough, and I expire. <laughs> right there in front of the microphone. <laughs> Jewel on the table. And my wife came out and slapped me in the head. No, she's classier than that. She didn't slap me in the head. But she did say, get out, come on, get to bed. By the way, you'll meet her. She's coming in October. And I, I'm anxious for you to do the, to meet her. And by the way, she dreads, she's not a public speaker. She's coming to speak to your women here at Calvary Chapel, C, uh, Chino Valley. And you will, you'll be blessed. She's not a, one of those people that just, like, it's not her gift, it's not her ability. She dreads it, and she's going to die to herself and do it anyway because she has something to say. But I'm excited for you to see just how normal this woman is <laughs> that I married. <laughs> how she's so everything I'm not. She's so, she is as feminine as I ain't. And um, anyway, she came out. She came out and goes, get, get that bed. And I stand up. You guys know how this is. You stand up and go, yeah, okay. Go staggering in for the bedroom. Well, I only made it as far as the study because there's that glow from the fire. And there's a nice little, you know, warmth radiating from that wood stove. That's a happy place. There's a couch right across from it. That's as far as I got. Like, this is a happy, happy place. It was such a nice, warm feeling. And, you know, I, I fell asleep, you know. But then I woke up, fire's out, kind of cold. I woke up, and there's so much light coming through the window of my study. I thought, oh, man, it's time to get up. What a short night. Well, let's hit it. Got to go. Day begins right at 6, right? And I'm staggering over to where my desk is, not wanting to turn on any lights. You know, I, I open up my cell phone. And I look at the time. It's only 2.30. And I had that overwhelming, happy feeling of, I got, I got three and a half hours. <laughs> I do the math. I got, I got. Yay, I'm going to bed. I'm going to crawl in bed with that, that woman and go back to sleep. I get three and a half more hours. You've had that feeling, right? It's like, yes, it's not. I thought it was time to go, and I'm like, oh, and it's not time to go. Well, in the morning, this young man, Travis, now he's riding in, in with me, first thing, at the workout, then we're going to, to work. and I'm relating to all these little happy experiences. We had a good dinner that night before, you know. Everything about the evening was good. It was all good. It was a mix, you know. As I'm relating all of that to him, he's looking at me. And he, he, with, with sadness, he goes, I'm only just beginning. Only beginning to, be, to feel any of those things again. This is like 40 days clean. Apparently, he's like, I'm only just now beginning to actually know pleasure from an experience. Isn't that sad? And we're surrounded, guys, all over this neighborhood, all over this region, this whole state, our whole nation. There are people that are enslaved to a fake pleasure and illusion. That's all it is. It's like the Matrix, you know, concept. 
They would like trade off everything. They would trade off their health, their family, they trade off everything for just the illusion. Just euphoria. It's just a little pleasure. It's not even real pleasure. Revelation chapter 4. Listen to this. This is, just hear this verse. Revelation 4.11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You know what God is all about pleasure. It is for his pleasure. It's all done. The whole program is for God's pleasure. God is, in fact, into pleasure. C.S. Lewis, in his genius work, Screwtape Letters, has one of the devils praising God, of course, by a devil's complaint complains that he, our enemy, is a hedonist at heart. He really lives for pleasure, which is true. <laughs> he is, he's all about pleasure. He is involved in a program of sustaining all that he created for his good pleasure. Consider this. Turn with me to Luke chapter 8 in that parable of the sower. Luke chapter 8, verse 14. Luke 8, 14. Hear these words from the Son of God. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Choked. Pleasure. Pleasure is plural have the capacity in our experience to choke out the very word of God that would produce fruit. Cares, riches, and pleasures. Is there anything wrong with pleasure? No, there's something wrong with the pleasures of this life. Well, consider this. What is written about Moses in Hebrews chapter 11? That's worth noting and worth reading. Hebrews chapter 11. Speaking of Moses choice, which was by faith. It is written in Hebrews 11, 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the, daughter of Pharaoh, the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. The pleasures. Sin is, in fact, very pleasurable. It's the reason why people do it. So much pleasure. There's Moses in a position that very few people find themselves in. Well, the whole world has been given to him, in a sense. Whole world. I mean, they have, they have rolled up the red carpet. He is so set up. He comes to a fork in the road, a fork in the road where he has to choose not just between two peoples, but between two ways of living, affliction and pleasure. And it was by faith he chose against pleasure. He refused. There's quite a verb. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused to be the prince of Egypt. He refused and refused all the pleasure that goes with it. Think about Moses. What do you think about him? Young Moses. Maybe he is somewhat full of himself. Maybe, you know, the, the, you know uh, Stephen's words. At his trial, Stephen gives that little history lesson, mentions Moses, the guy's mighty in word and deed. He's accomplished, he's educated, he's dynamic, man, he's, he's like a superhero, and he thinks he is one. He does. He, he assumed that his own people, the Jews, wouldn't recognize him as their savior. He, he made all kinds of assumptions. I mean, how could they not? He's awesome. How could they not? He's like, here, I come to save the day. Stop right there. Unhand him. You know, he, he, he's rejected. Shocking. Absolutely. Utterly rejected. So he's got some things wrong with him. Some things that will be broken by suffering. But ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, he was at a fork in the road. Flawed though he may have been, and by faith, he saw down one road. Ultimate pleasure. That was eternal. 
but in the immediate affliction. Down this other road, immediate pleasure and ultimate and eventual affliction. Consider those two things. Will you please just consider the contrast between two different kinds of pleasure. One that is immediate but temporary. The other one is eventual but it's eternal. Immediate and temporary versus eventual and permanent, eternal. Recently, as we you know, went past the uh, memorial of uh, D-Day, we were forced once again to think about that generation that fought, a generation that formed an army, built battleships, built weaponry, took on the worst enemies of life on earth, and beat them in less time than it took the Obama administration to get a website up. months just for the record that generation that generation that didn't borrow money they saved they saved they put off gratification they had a concept of delayed gratification that whatever it is it is worth waiting for something that their grandchildren their great grandchildren don't know anything about no delayed gratification in this particular age we live in Instant gratification. They understood that you save, you sacrifice, you work hard, and ultimately you experience reward. What happened since then in our culture? That there's no waiting, there's no sacrificing. Was that they say that um, the rich stay rich by living like they're poor? The poor stay poor by living like they're rich? Profoundly true, isn't it? By the way, I got a Facebook page. Give me a friend request. I'll welcome you in. <laughs> I'm, I'm amazed. I've always hated that. Just, you know, I've always hated that medium. I've hated social media. I've called it Wastebook, and it is for so many. <laughs> but once I decided I'm going to influence that, once I said, oh, you know, all right, it, it exists, I'm going in. Once I, <laughs> once I decided to do that, I started collecting friends. The kind of people that friend request me are people that know Bible, and they know politics, they know you know world events, and they got a sense of humor. And the stuff they put, they contribute. There's nobody on my news feed. Nobody's welcome to go. Oh, I'm at the donut shop now because that's stupid, and I don't really care. <laughs> but you, you, you're the center of the universe. You got to tell everybody where you are. What in the world? Who do you look? Just find something more important that you can contribute. And the contributions that people I'm blown away. But it's like all of a sudden I've got thousands of, i got a staff of thousands of researchers. And they're sending news, they're putting it on there, and then I am putting it out to all my friends. It is amazing to me, actually. Amazing. No trivia. I don't, I, I, anybody's putting trivia on there, anything stupid. Unfriend you. <laughs> I will. <laughs> and I'll tell them, too. You are not unworthy. But it's quotes like that. You know, the, the rich, the, many of them are rich because they live like they're poor. Many of the poor are poor because they live like they're rich. Way above their means because they want it now. Because they borrow, they go in such deep debt. God. Pleasures contrasted here in Scripture, as is in the parable of the sower, pleasures of this life. And here in the quote in uh, Hebrews 11, about Moses choosing to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than the pleasures of sin for a season. Realizing that that's temporary. That pleasure is going to be short-lived. And then on the other side of the pleasure, you got to pay. I said the old expression, you got to pay the piper. I haven't dug into that one. Who's the piper? I don't get what is What piper? It has to have something to do with you got to pay the band, I guess, for the gig. That, you know, you, I guess. Party's over, now you've got to pay the piper. There must be that. Whatever. Look at this verse. This is, to me, this is an apt description from 2 Timothy. The description of the last days, the end of time, and the reality of people's heart condition. Tell me, tell me, guys, that this is not. Oh, by the way, on the subject of 
drugs and people living for pleasure. It is not, as far as I'm concerned, the illicit and illegal drugs and that whole massive evil market, this, this pharmacia, the sorcery, that ultimately has people doing things that they would never do in their right mind, has turned everyone completely rabid. That, bad as it is, as far as I'm concerned, pales to the damage that is done by the pharmaceutical industry. Do you know what every single mass shooting has in common? Mm, not a gun. A drug you never hear about. An antidepressant that not only keeps the bad guy from feeling depressed, it also keeps him from feeling any empathy, any compassion, makes him capable of doing the worst kind of things that we've ever heard done. Rental cars got the Fox News Channel satellite radio, and I'm listening to that on the way here today. You guys are, it, Las Vegas, two cops are shot sitting eating pizza. Just people walk in and just shoot them and then take their weapons and go to Walmart and start killing more before they, sh they shoot each other. That's insane. I guarantee the thing you will not hear is the drugs played a role. You don't hear it. That, that information is suppressed. You don't hear it. You've got to dig to find that. And so all this, you know, doctor confidentiality thing. And, and they act as if it is irrelevant. It is not irrelevant. Anyway, this Second Timothy passage. Um, Second Timothy describes in chapter 3, verse 1, know this, this know, that, this know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, when men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Ah. That kind of pleasure. The kind of pleasure that would rival God. Such idolatry. Likewise, in Titus chapter 3, this statement, also by the Apostle Paul, in Titus 3.3, 3, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, sometimes, we once were, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we've done. But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That's where we once were before the grace of God interrupted us. We lived for pleasure, did we not? That we then can identify with a generation of the world around us that has absolutely gone mad in their lust for pleasure. But consider this. Back in Psalms, turn back to the Old Testament with me. And look at what David wrote in what is a prophetic psalm. Psalm 16. The 16th Psalm. I'm turning with you. Psalm 16, look at the description we have in the 11th verse. That 10th verse is the prophecy that Peter, the apostle Peter, quoted it on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, when he said, this is, you know, thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, it was a prophecy. David prophesied concerning Christ. Yeah, we killed him. We rejected him. We rejected the prince of life. And asked for a murderer to be released to us. Peter indicted the whole Jewish people and said, But God will forgive us. But he points out that David prophesied that Christ would die and would rise from the dead. And then on the other side of that verse, verse 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life. And in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. You, you get that? At God's right hand. Pleasures like no one could ever imagine. Pleasures that are eternal. Pleasures forevermore at God's right hand. Eventual. Also in the 
36th Psalm. Look at that one. Psalm 36. Verse 7, how excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house. Thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. <laughs> That's that. That's a nice verse right there. There's a concept. The river of thy pleasures. Drink of it. But it is not here and now, and this is not heaven. And in fact, heaven will not be found on this earth. You know, I'm amazed. Those who don't run to a chemical, that just live for pleasure, live for their, their, their drug is just eros, romance. Their obsession is the euphoria associated with a new romance. I mean, what is it about it? A kiss. A kiss on the lips between two people of opposite gender. <laughs> what is it about that event that is merely joining the sweet end of 30 feet of digestive system? <laughs> that makes... Fireworks happen. Mind-blowing rush of euphoria, the thrill of it. When it's new. When it's new, right, there's fireworks. I can testify to you. Having been married to a good woman for 30 years, the 1984, late July, when I planted that first kiss, I thought I was going to faint. I was trying to act like a man, trying to be tough. <laughs> I played like I was cool, but I fluttered. <laughs> oh, the thrill of it. Oh, the rush. I'll never forget it. 30 years later, we find, wow, we can forget to do that. There's so no fireworks. I mean, I know, maybe I should say seldom. Well, maybe it's, there's little firecrackers. <laughs> we're, we're getting old. We're like, we're like, we're not tired of each other. Nothing. I love that girl. She loves me, but oh yeah, have I kissed you today? No, I don't think so. Okay, come over here. And there's a little, sometimes it's that little spark. Like when you're taking off a wool sweater, a little static. <laughs> Now, you know what I'm talking about. You married people. He's like, you want to make it thrilling? Make it forbidden. Somehow or another. Somebody's got to come along and forbid you from kissing your wife. And all of a sudden, the thrill comes back. You want to sneak around, you're going to find a way. Because we're stupid. Because we're all messed up. But C.S. Lewis, he points out in his book, The Four Loves, I highly recommend that book, he points out in that Eros chapter that Eros is the really temporary kind. It's really, of all of the loves, it's almost like the, more, the most inferior of the four. You know, it's, it's fleeting. You can't count on it. It will not keep two people together. People do not stay bound together by Eros. Nobody does. It's why you make vows. It's why you make commitments. You have all your friends and family come over. You go, I want you to watch this because you hold me to this because I've chosen this woman. Though I can't imagine it today, I know the day will come where I'll question that choice. <laughs> and I know she will. Tomorrow. <laughs> so, so I want you guys to witness we're making promises that we're saying we're going to stay together until we die. Nothing but death will part us. That's what we do marriage for. That's why. But C.S. Lewis says, it has to be that way. It has to. Eros has to sort of fade. It can't be like it is when it's brand new, or you'll get nothing done. <laughs> you will sit around and just kiss. you stay locked up and do nothing. You won't even, you won't accomplish anything. There'll be no, you won't pay the bills. You'll be like an addict. You'll be a, I must have this, the kiss. That's all. I must have the kiss. You'll wear your lips out. You'll end up with calluses. You'll look weird. 
Imagine your lips being like the bottom of your feet in summertime. <laughs> All cracked and peeling. It's quite a thought to explore, isn't it? But he's right. If it stayed like it was the summer of 1984, I'd have done nothing from then till now. Nothing. I would, I'd be pathetic. I'd be just waiting around going, when are you coming home? <laughs> Can we kiss again? <laughs> I wouldn't act like that on the outside, but I'd be thinking it. Pleasures eternal. God offers to us drinking of the river of God's pleasure. What an expression. The river of thy pleasures. A couple more verses before you, for you before I let you leave. Well, you can leave any time. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. Before a formal dismissal. <laughs> Who do preachers think they are? Anyway. Just get all done and go, you're dismissed. <laughs> who, do they who do they think they are? <laughs> and finally, in closing, you don't do that in any conversation, do you? <laughs> wouldn't, that be, wouldn't that be an absolute absurdity? <laughs> and finally, in closing, <laughs> Luke chapter 12. Look at this. Luke chapter 12. <laughs> Right in the middle of this beautiful picture, this parable, in Luke chapter 12, verse 32, look at what the Lord Jesus said. And this is right after saying, you know what, don't fear anybody, can only just kill your body and that's all they can do. I'll tell you who to fear. Look, let's fear God. Fear him who has the power to send body and soul to hell. Yeah, I say to you, fear him. And then he goes, but then again. Verse 32, fear not, little flock. <laughs> fear not, little flock. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Give it to you. Not make you earn your way into it. No, it's, it's his pleasure to give it and to give it to you. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God says in Ezekiel 18 and also again in Ezekiel 33, both those places in the Old Testament, he said, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that he would turn. What does the Son of God say? But there is more rejoicing in heaven over one that repents than over the 99 that needed no repenting. So God is all into the pleasure of going, yes, everybody in heaven is cheering. No pleasure in the death of the wicked, and yet the wicked do in fact die. God has made promises to us. I'm amazed by what he's promised. <laughs> Giving us life. Everlasting life for free. He gave us life for free. He gave it to us. It's free. A free gift. Then, once you receive that gift, he makes you this offer. Tell you what, work for me and I'll pay you. Go to work for me and I'll pay you. As if heaven's not enough. He's like, I will reward you. In fact, he keeps saying in the Sermon on the Mount, your father that sees what you do in secret will reward you openly. He's like these other, these losers, these, the Lord goes, don't, when you pray, when you fast, or you give to the poor, any of those things, don't do it like these hypocrites. They make a big show out of it. So everybody thinks they're awesome. He goes, truly, I'm telling you, they got all the reward they're ever going to get. He said. Truly, they have the reward. It's actually implied in the language, they have all the reward. That's a puny little, that's not even good math. To look at that and go, yeah, I just want everybody to pat me on the back and say, wow, well, you're really spiritual. And that's it. When what you could have is God himself saying, well done, good and faithful slave. Enter thou into the joy of your Lord. Enter into the joy of your Lord. You were faithful in that which is little. I'm going to give you that which is great. The promise of God to you and me 
of reward, of great riches, of drinking from the river of his pleasure, is on the other side of our own cross. The invitation, if you want to follow Christ, deny self, take up cross, and follow. What is written in Hebrews chapter 12? To the believer. But on the other side of that whole thing, where in Hebrews 11, where we hear about Moses and his choice. We hear about Abraham. We hear about all these other people. They testify to us that this is a good deal. We have in Hebrews chapter 12 the statement. Well, seeing that we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Witnesses. Let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Those witnesses aren't up there cheering stupid Christian songs that have them in the stands. Got, check this out. They got better things to do. All those who've gone on. They're not up there cheering. They're not up there witnessing our race. No, they're witnessing to us by their life. The record of their life it testifies to us that this living for eternity, choosing as Moses did, as, as others did, for something that was way off. They, all, they died having not yet received. People like Abraham, living in tents with the patriarchs. Making a statement, he's looking for something permanent. He's looking for a city. He's builder and maker is God. He's looking for something that's eternal. They're all testifying to us. And since we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses testifying to us of the faithfulness of God, the worthiness of this deal, then let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, that right there, Christian, the delayed gratification, the joy that was set before him, it was set before him and it was way out there ahead of him, who for the joy that was set before him endured the immediate, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We got stuff to go through some of which may even involve persecution. Bring it. Some of it may involve the shame and humiliation, being labeled as haters, extremists, all those things. We have to endure temptation. We have to, in this life right now, say no to a whole bunch of stuff, even as Moses did. We must refuse. The illusion of the world of pornography 80% of all the men in this country right now, including the Christians, regularly view pornography. This is another fantasy land. It's another form of drug, another attempt at euphoria. It's not even real. 30% of all the women. The numbers are the same inside what is called the church in this country as they are outside. Living for pleasure. We now have to refuse all of that. Choose rather to experience affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. We've got to do a little bit more math than that. We've got to look ahead. We've got to look ahead. Brothers, listen. Listen to me. Brothers, we are all right now vulnerable as men, if you've got vision still and you have gadgetry, there are safeguards you got to take. You got to do whatever you got to do, man. You just got to get serious about this. You know what? Sometimes it blows my mind. A, a rat, a rodent can do this math. A rodent can find one of its limbs in the trap, weigh it all out, and go, you know what? I could stay here and die. Or I can chew that off, I can cut my tie to this death trap, and live on a tripod. <laughs> and a rat will do the math. There are ways, it's, it's amazing, the primates are supposed to be so you know, intelligent, so much, you know what I mean, the, the evolutionist in their insane thinking, that we're like related to them. The only time you, you think it might be is when you consider the monkey trap. The monkey trap that involves the gourd with a hole just big enough for a piece of fruit to fit in. Monkey, he sees the fruit, and he looks in, and he can't get his hands out with the fruit. The, the hole's not big enough for the fruit and his hand. 
and he won't give it up. Ah, ah, ah. He'll freak out and panic. He'll scream his head off. Ah! He'll like lose his mind as they're coming to take him away. But he won't give it up. Let that not be any one of us men. Do not let that be us. That alone, that one illustration, that one mental picture right there, ought to cause every man in this room with the internet access to go get some software to keep himself from being a monkey <laughs> with his hands stuck. I personally believe in, I do uh, Covenant Eyes. It's an internet browser. No, it's not anywhere near as good as Safari. But, oh, well. It's a tr <laughs> Safari is way more efficient. Everything wants to work off Safari. Covenant Eyes, less efficient, but I'm not alone. I don't live in a secret. You know, I got a brother it reports to. You do what you got to do. You take whatever measures you have to take. You cannot, here and now, live for the pleasures of sin for a season and still plan on eternal pleasure, drinking of the rivers of God's pleasure. Do you understand the theme of this message tonight? Couldn't be any plainer? I don't think. Um, it is either we choose the immediate and temporary, or we choose the eventual and the eternal pleasure. May I leave you with a poem? <laughs> I wrote it myself. <laughs> this here was written by me. So don't laugh at it. You'll hurt my feelings. You'll hurt my feeling. <laughs> I have one. With regard to choices, sacrifices, with regard to giving up what one loves, weighing it all out and seeing what has to be done. Consider this. Love went bad in Eden. It did. The reason why Adam, at that fork in the road that he came to, between the creator, the giver of the gift, and the giver, the woman that he loved, he came to that moment. I'm telling you, put it together. The simple statement from 1 Timothy chapter 2 that Adam, <clears throat> the man, was not deceived. The man was not deceived in Eden. He was not deceived. Nevertheless, Genesis chapter 3, we have the words, Adam, because you have done this, because thou hast done this, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, cursed is the ground for thy sake. Adam was not deceived, yet Adam hearkened to the voice of his wife. What does that mean? Well, that means she pleaded with him. Go where she's gone. She pleaded. She became the mother of all insecurity. She pleaded. And he made a choice, an insane choice. May sound all romantic. He chose to die with her. He took us all down with him, <laughs> sent us all to hell, every one of us. In Adam, all die. It's idolatry. Romantic as it may sound. Oh, he loved her so much. Yeah, well, he, he didn't do her any good by loving her more than God. The first time love is mentioned in the whole Bible, first time it appears, Genesis chapter 22, and that's the story, the account of God calling Abraham, Abraham, who has finally received the gift, the, the, the defining moment of Abraham's life. <laughs> There's a lot of things that happen in his life for which we should be grateful that he's not known for. The defining moment of his life was not when he's hiding behind his wife like some coward telling the half-truth. Um, she's my sister. You're my sister. Huh. Yeah. My sister. Be nice to me. The defining moment of his life was not then. Otherwise, Abraham would be the father of all cowards. Cowards. Like how that did that. All cowards. <laughs> Sorry. You guys are working hard over there on the sound. I know I'm a constant challenge on that. Or that other occasion. How about that one for which Abraham is, in fact, famous? The occasion when he, like a typical male, heard his wife say something. And he thought she meant that. Instead of listening to her heart, he heard her words. And she said, you know, why don't you take this, this maid servant of mine, Hagar. Yeah, go lay with her. Yeah, that's it. I want you to have sex with her. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, do that. And maybe that's how we'll have a child. 
You know what he was supposed to do, ladies? He was supposed to say, what? How could you even suggest it? Baby, no way. That girl, she's way too young and pretty for me. Way too skinny. No. How could you even suggest it to me, Sarah? This is no big thing for God. There's all kinds of things he was supposed to say. What did he say? Sarah, you are one insightful woman. You know, I was just thinking that very thing like that. You are on to something, girl. Well, I'm glad that's not the defining moment of his life, are you not? He'd be the father of all idiots. I, I thank God for the grace that took him to another place. And the thing that he's known for is for God saying to him, Abraham, I want you to offer up your son, your only son whom you love. It's the first time the word love appears in the Bible. Now, love was the issue back in Eden. Man was tested and man failed. The next big test that involves love is Abraham. You know how it turned out. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that he did the math. He weighed it out. And he determined, you know what? God told me he'd give me a son. He kept his promise. He proved himself faithful. I believe in him. If he wants me to offer up my son, then he must be planning to raise him from the dead. He can do it. He can do it. He can make an old couple like us conceive in our old age. He can bring this kid back to life. I'll do it. So, I wrote this here. I don't know if it's a poem as much as it's sort of a riddle. It's a riddle. I have to read it to you because I haven't memorized it yet. If I hadn't done, in fact, today's first time I really, this morning at um, Calvary Chapel Upland, I, I think I'm going to break it out. Wrote it. Might as well do something with it. <laughs> it's the riddle of Adam and Abram by Ken Graves. <laughs> Try to follow me on this, and then I'll let you go. <laughs> Whatever. You can go whenever you want. Try to follow this. It is written in the form of a riddle. The, the phrase, from the council of the three came the promise of the one. Into a hill would come a tree. Into a tree would come the sun. Get that? Kind of cool. <laughs> Multiple meanings. He made one into two. And gave them to each other. Two became one, each one with a lover. But the gift became a goddess to the one she was given, and love became a demon by one cast out of heaven. But her lover so loved her. Is he loved her so? Would he hold on now, or must he let go? Were she to be damned, then damn him as well. The gift, not the giver, and the lover chose hell. From the council of the three, Came the promise of the one. To a hill would come a tree. To the tree would come the sun. The giver gave again, and the gift was the sun. And from the love of the two came the life of the one. When given the choice, what choice would he choose? When to live you must die, and to win you must lose. Would this lover trust or act on his fear? Would he offer him up through the smoke and the tears? To pierce love's heart would break his heart too, but when love asks for love, what less can one do? And from the council of the three came the promise of the one. To a hill would come a tree, and to the tree would come the sun. By love given back and through the gift that's been returned, the mystery of one who would rise would be learned. One came to die, to die for the many, and that grave that was filled is the grave that was emptied. Thank you. Thank you. You don't have to do that just because I handed a poem, but thank you. The, 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 the wisdom of God puts mankind in this place where we must choose, and every one of us must continue to choose. The choices are laid out before us. The winners of history chose 
eternity, eternal bliss, eternal pleasure. The losers chose immediate. If there's something that you have come to love and that, it, that love rivals your love for God, then choose. Let it go. Offer it up. However that works out for you, offer it up. Just do what you have to do.